Once upon a time, cigarette smoke filled airplanes and restaurants, and children rode carefree without a seatbelt in the backs of station wagons. This is In the Loop. I'm Bianca Fischini, in for Christian Bryant. In most of the nation, school is back in full swing, and with it comes the debate on whether to have students and staff mask up or not. At least eight states have approved legislation or put in place executive actions to prevent local schools from enforcing a mask mandate against the advice of health officials. What the science tells us clearly uh, is a few things. It tells us that if our kids are old enough to be vaccinated, that that's a powerful pathway to reduce their chances of getting sick or spreading to others. It tells us also that masks work to reduce the spread of infection. Several school districts have pushed back on state level bans on mask mandates, choosing to disregard them and require masks on school property. But sometimes we've got to do something that's greater for the community. Isn't that the least we can do for our children? If it saves one life, 10 hospitalizations, isn't that the least that we can do? It's a tricky situation for elementary schools, especially since vaccines are only currently approved for kids over 12. That's almost 50 million Americans who are not eligible to get a shot. This week, more than 8,000 students in just one Florida school district are currently isolating or under quarantine. Even as the number of COVID cases continue to rise there, the State Board of Education is investigating districts who enforce the state's no mask mandate policy. If the board finds a district is mandating masks, they may withhold state funding, including teacher and staff salaries. In a move to counter those state penalties, U.S. Education Secretary Miguel Cardona told both Texas and Florida governors that school districts can then use COVID relief funds if they're sanctioned by their state for enforcing mask policies. The showdown between federal and state governments over masks in schools comes at a precarious time for kids in COVID. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, more than 120,000 kids in the U.S tested positive for COVID last week. That represents 18% of the weekly cases reported. The Department of Health and Human Services reported a record high on Saturday when 1,900 children were hospitalized. And now tens of thousands of students across the country are quarantined after going back to school in person. More vaccines for children could diffuse some of this debate around masks in schools, but the FDA says vaccines for kids may not be available until midwinter. The mask debate is nothing new. It's been raging on almost as long as COVID-19 has, and similar debates around public health and personal freedom have been around even longer. Newsy's Amber Strong takes us through a bit of history to explain. Once upon a time, cigarette smoke filled airplanes and restaurants, and children rode carefree without a seatbelt in the backs of station wagons. That was then, and this is now. There's been a lot of conversation lately between public health and personal freedom, especially with the uptick in COVID-19 vaccine and mask mandates, which begs the question, how do we go from those carefree rides in the back of that Chevy to this five-point harness? Spoiler alert, it didn't happen overnight. Doctors started discussing the importance of lap belts in the 1930s, but widespread seatbelt laws wouldn't come for another 50 years after the Reagan administration put pressure on the auto industry. The auto manufacturers had to provide other safety um, precautions like side airbags, unless X percent of the states actually implemented seatbelt laws. So that actually gave motivation for the manufacturers to go out and campaign for seatbelt laws. So the government pressured car makers who pressured the states and you ended up with cool ads like this one. Just give it a click. Click it or tick it. But that doesn't mean consumers were on board. This is going to affect my freedom, affect my liberty. Um, and it's funny to think about that because nowadays people don't think twice about putting a, on a seatbelt. Now, nearly all states have some kind of seatbelt law and additional laws for children except New Hampshire, where even today, adults are not required to buckle up. But the arguments here echo another freedom versus safety debate. You see how easy it is to keep a man happy? Why not give your husband a carton of Philip Morris cigarettes? You wouldn't see an ad like this today, but it took years of research before the federal declaration that smoking was a problem. There was a very strong relationship and probably a causal relationship between heart disease and 
cigarette smoke. That report was followed by warnings on the sides of smokes and ads pulled from TV. Surgeon General C. Everett Koop then led a relentless government-sponsored campaign to stamp it out completely. If I had my way, I would say it is just as addictive as heroin or cocaine. Koop pushed the idea that not only was smoking dangerous, secondhand smoke was a threat to others. Dr. Bruce Wiley, a professor of health policy and management at CUNY, says the industry didn't go down without a fight or a little misinformation. There was statements by people who ultimately we found fund, were funded by the tobacco industry that claimed that, oh, there's no problem with, with, uh, with tobacco. It would take until the year 2000 to see smoking disappear completely from U.S. airplanes. Consumers also helped with the push. We got to a situation where there are enough people who didn't want smoking around them. And so, so you're actually, have, you're, you've reached an inflection point. If your club or your restaurant allows um, smoking, then you're actually going to lose customers as a result. Lee says when it comes down to the acceptance of these current health debates, it will depend on multiple partners, the public, politicians, and people working together. Amber Strong Newsy, Washington. Here to talk to us about that piece you just watched is Newsy reporter Amber Strong. Ember, one thing that's different between the mask and vaccine debate surrounding COVID versus smoking is the fact that we always knew this virus was dangerous. Smoking, on the other hand, was a norm in American life for a really long time. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? How did smoking influence pop culture in ways we wouldn't even imagine today? Hey, Bianca. Yeah, so smoking sort of permeated every inch of American lives. I was going through this old footage and was just blown away by images of like Fred Flintstone lighting up a pack of Winstons. And I Love Lucy was sponsored by Philip Morris. And it was just part of life. It was everywhere. Um, and even after the ads were sort of yanked from television, there were still billboards. There were still magazines that targeted just clearly targeted children, targeted minorities, sort of surreal, a surreal juxtaposition to, to what we think of and what we see of smoking today. Yeah, and one thing that people may not realize uh, surrounding the, the vaccine requirement debate is that it's more than a century old. So how do the vaccine protests of the 1900s compare to the vaccine protests today? Yeah, believe it or not, vaccines were not <laughs> um, accepted then as well. We can go all the way back to uh, 1905. There was a pastor by the name of Henning Jacobson who refused to get a small po smallpox vaccine, um, even though it was mandated in, in Boston at the time. He refused the vaccine. He refused the $5 fine. And he took that fight all the way to the Supreme Court. Now, the court did rule in favor um, of the state, and that sort of laid the groundwork to the Jacobson case, as it's known today, that's been used to um, answer questions on the debate of public health versus personal freedom. But it, that case is still sort of litigated to this day. We saw that last year when Governor Andrew Cuomo sort of put in this uh, rule about limitations on capacities of houses of worship. And the Supreme Court stepped in and said, hey, you know, Jacobson is not a blank check. You have to sort of lay the groundwork for uh, exemptions in certain cases. And so it's very interesting. A lot of the legal minds that I've, I've read or people that I've talked to said that as these vaccine mandates go out, uh, we can go back to 1905 and try to lean on Jacobson, but, but states and local governments are going to have to be careful in how they do it. Yeah, it certainly sounds that that ruling did not end the debate over vaccine mandates at all. Newsy reporter Amber Strong, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Bianca. We take a step away from the noise and spam to really hear the stories that need to be told. Newsy cuts through. There's three American girls competing for the top two Olympic spots. I could go into this and come out with nothing. 